What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoWatt video and in today's video I'm going to be building an awesome $2,000 gaming PC build for 2021. Featuring a Ryzen 7 CPU, an RTX 3070 Ti GPU and some awesome hardware, this build is going to be a good one. I'm going to run you through all the parts I chose and why, put the system together from start right through to finish before booting it up and testing it out with some of the biggest and most popular gaming titles out there. Make sure to get subscribed if you aren't already, but let's dive into it. As usual on the GeekerWatt channel, we're going to kick things off with the easier components to begin with, meaning we need to put Cooler Master's fancy new Illusion Cooler, very excited about this one, to one side for a moment's time. We're going to kick things off then with the motherboard and the CPU. Now this right here is Gigabyte's Aorus B550 Pro. I think that B550 is on the whole a better buy than X570 in 2021 if you're not looking for an extreme feature set or loads and loads of overclocking. In fact, in our review of the Aorus X570 Master, we were actually pretty impressed. But for a build like this, I think a B550 board is going to suffice. I'm going to be coupling it up with AMD's Ryzen 7 5800X. They're a great pairing for NVIDIA's powerful new range of 3070 Ti GPUs, which we'll be looking at later in today's video. With high core counts and high clock speeds, they do the job really nicely and install very easily into the motherboard. Ryzen chips on the whole do tend to keep a little bit cooler as well than their Intel counterparts, which is always a bonus. I'm going to be coupling it up with some memory from Giel, Gale? Gale. If anyone knows how to pronounce this, let me know in the comments below. This is a kit of their Orion memory. It's available in either a dark grey or a red colour. I've gone for the more neutral dark grey in this build, as while I do like some bright colours every now and again, I want the build to look a bit more stealthy. The memory dims are going to install into the second and fourth dim slots on the motherboard and do so really easily. You want to line the notch up on the memory with the notch on the slot and then just pull back the retention clips. Once you've done that, you can go ahead and install the RAM dims at one by one, applying a bit of pressure to both sides. And that brings us nicely on to the next component, which is the SSD storage. Now I've gone for an NVMe M.2 drive, but no ordinary M.2 drive. This right here is a PCIe Gen 4 drive. What that means in real terms is you get speeds up to seven gigabytes per second. That's right, you can do seven gigabytes per second or around about 350 gigabytes every minute. You could fill this one terabyte drive in three minutes. That's ridiculous. Now, there is actually a reason for this. The new 3070 Ti and 3080 Ti are so powerful that storage actually can become a bottleneck. When you can't read that game fast enough, you actually end up being restricted by the storage rather than the GPU. And that's really the last thing that you want to happen. Fast speeds, good reliability, a pretty good price point and a great reputation make it an awesome option for a build like this. This is the case choice in question and it's Cooler Master's superb TD500 mesh. This case is fantastic though, I've used it a few times on the channel, you can find that my first video where I look really young uh, with this case in the card section now. It's got a really cool polygon mesh from panel, it's also got kind of a polygon side panel that's tempered glass, it's great as far as cable management is concerned with good clearance for GPUs, CPU coolers, radiators, and all that good stuff. Really is a fantastic case at a great price point. With the case out of the box then, you can really see what I mean about that side panel with these cool kind of polygon lines. It just looks absolutely awesome. Let's go ahead and remove all of the side panels on the case uh, first of all, so we can go ahead and get the motherboard in and then of course our CPU cooler. In order to do this, simply find the nine holes through the motherboard, three along the top, three along the middle and three along the bottom and match these up with the corresponding holes on the motherboard tray. It's then a simple case of sliding the motherboard in nice and easily, lining up the nine standoffs with the nine holes on the motherboard. Fasten the motherboard down with the included screws that you get with the case and we're pretty much good to go. You know what? That's looking pretty good and allows us to move on to the next component today, the CPU cooler. Now this CPU cooler is actually one of the most exciting components in the build. It's brand new from Cooler Master and it's called their 
Illusion. Uh, now, in all seriousness, it does look pretty good. It's got a nice water block design, a 360mm radiator, as well as their new addressable RGB kind of ring style fans that we've seen on the market for a little while. This case does have ARGB fans as standard, so these can either go for a push pull config or move to the top of the case. That's probably more likely. But let's go ahead and first of all fasten the actual radiator into place, and then we'll look in more detail at the CPU water block afterwards and decide exactly how we want to do things. Step one then is to remove the existing fans at the front of the case, a little something like this. And step two is to actually install the new radiator and the new fans at the front of the chassis. First impressions of the block then are pretty good. It's got this turnable Cooler Master logo, which is a nice feature, uh, and it's nice and small, nice and compact, which is unusual nowadays. You need to take these brackets and actually screw them onto the block, and then it clips onto the motherboard really nice and easily. It's pretty simple as far as installation methods go, and that's nice to see. And then it's a super simple case of dropping on a dab of thermal paste and fastening the cooler into place a little something like this. Not too difficult and we'll deal with the cables and wiring a little bit later. You know what? That's actually looking really quite nice. And it brings us nicely on to the next... Uh, the graphics card I've gone for is an NVIDIA RTX 3070 Ti. Now a big shout out to both Gigabyte and NVIDIA for helping to make uh, part of today's video possible. The new RTX 3070 Ti really does plug a bit of a gap in the market that I saw between the 70 and the 80. Both fantastic cards in their own right, but for those looking for that little bit more power for 4K gaming without breaking the bank, that's where the 3070 Ti comes in. With plenty of video memory, some really fast speeds, and loads of power for 1440p and 4K gaming, it's a great card. With ray tracing in some of the latest titles out there as well, which we'll test out in a moment's time, and widened support for DLSS, Rainbow Six Siege Anyone, the latest Call of Duty Warzone update, this is a really versatile card. Would you just look at that for a GPU? The three large fans here, this cool gigabyte call out with a little bit of RGB. We've got a really nice backplate as well, which will help prevent GPU sag, as well as a really nice IO at the rear, and all in all, a pretty good design that doesn't escape too far out of a two slot form factor. Dual eight pin GPU power connectors as well, keep this card pretty efficient, but give it the power that it needs. And we'll dive into some detailed performance and benchmark numbers in in just a moment. But before that, let's get the power supply installed, get the graphics card installed, and really wrap up the build part of today's video. Here we go, just gonna slide that into our top PCIe slot, clip it into place, and that's looking pretty good. There is enough clearance actually for us to put those fans we have from earlier uh, behind the radiator, but I think they'll look better at the top and the rear of the case. Before we do that though, we have one more component left to go, and that is of course, the one and only power supply. Now this right here is Cooler Master's MWE Gold 750 watt V2 fully modular power supply. In short, it's a 750 watt unit, perfect for a build like this, with a fully modular interface that allows you to only plug in the cables you actually need. It's semi-fanless, keeping it super quiet, and the gold rating means it's really efficient. That's done by an external body, that's not just a Cooler Master rating as well, uh, which is always good to see on any power supply from any brand. Let's go ahead and get the power supply installed then, add those fans at the top and at the rear of the chassis, and then boot it up to see how it performs. Uh, of course, in all those ray tracing and DLSS titles with the 3070 Ti, but first, how good it looks in an epic glam montage. Roll the montage. <laughs> This system is one of the best looking PCs I've built. I love those new Cooler Master Illusion fans at the front of that mesh panel. It looks absolutely awesome. Now that we've seen how good the system looks though, let's dive into performance. On your screen now is a snapshot, a summary of all the different games we tested out. We're going to take a closer look into some of these titles in a moment, exploring DLSS and ray tracing numbers as well. But for now, this gives you a nice kind of overall outlook of the performance you can expect building a system like this. The first of the focus titles today is actually Watch Dogs Legion. At 1440p high settings with ray tracing on and of course DLSS, we got 76, 71 and 66 frames per second for the average 90 and 99th percentile results. 
DLSS, of course, being NVIDIA's AI-backed resolution scalar, which really helps to give us that FPS boost and offset any hit we might get from enabling ray tracing, which of course aids that visual experience by quite a large margin. It's a similarly positive story in Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War. Looking first at the 1440p numbers uh, with DLSS enabled but RTX disabled, and here we got 144 frames per second on average. The Cold War Zombies mode is a prime example of where DLSS can be super handy for gamers looking to get the maximum possible frame rate. Even with ray tracing on, we still managed to achieve nearly 70 frames per second and well over that crucial 60 FPS mark at high settings 1440p. Apex Legends is the next title and it's a good test of just overall rasterization and the power that a card like this has in the purest of senses. Here at 1440p high settings, we got 206 frames per second on average, showing that you don't need to game at low resolutions in order to get those esports level frame rates. Valorant is a similarly positive story. At 1440p high, you get 350 frames per second on average, give or take, on the RTX 3070 Ti, with once again strong 90 and 99th percentile numbers. Cyberpunk 2077 is next, and this is a game that is poised uh, for a bit of DLSS and ray tracing. So much so that without DLSS, Cyberpunk actually becomes a much more difficult game to run. At 1440p medium settings with DLSS enabled, we got 109 frames per second on average. Over 100 FPS at Cyberpunk 1440p is not a bad result, while turning ray tracing on with the same settings at 1440p medium across the board, we got 71 frames per second on average. So here in Cyberpunk, regardless of whether you're using ray tracing, DLSS well and truly saves the day. Next up then is Fortnite. Here at 1080p competitive settings, we got 217 frames per second on average, with strong 90 and 99th percentile results in the region of 191 and 165. We've talked before about why we don't test Fortnite with ray tracing on, but we do recommend the use of DLSS on NVIDIA GPUs like this 3070 Ti to maximize that frame rate. At 4K in Fortnite, a resolution we wouldn't usually test out, but it's a good kind of illustration of my point, we were still able to achieve 118 frames per second on average when leveraging DLSS. Call of Duty Warzone is the final game on our focus title list today, and here at 4K high settings with DLSS enabled, we got 135 FPS on average, with strong 90 and 99th percentile results, which very, very rarely wavered below that all-important 100 FPS minimum mark. The game looked great, and of course played really well with no lag, no stuttering, or screen tearing. And on that note, that wraps it up, not only for the benchmarks today, but the whole video. If you enjoyed this one, give it a big old like rating, make sure to get subscribed. Thank you for watching though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.